Okay, <laughs> we're ready to go. Um, one other thing I want to do, I'll just turn the mic briefly, but I always want to remind of us of our six principles of discernment. Every time we're discussing things together, this sort of frames our discussions. We do this particularly on the Sunday forum when we think there are more prickly subjects, and we're going to talk about money, faith, work, and economics. And so at any time we talk about these things that are so personal to us, we want to re just remind ourselves that we want to uh, speak and listen with respect. Uh, we want to listen. Usually when someone expresses an opinion, especially one very different than our own, there is an experience behind that that has informed their views, listening to each other. We want to speak only for ourselves, not for all Lutherans or not for all mm -hmm. women or men or whatever it might be. Um, we want to understand other viewpoints. That's a big deal of, of being in person again. We can ask, what, what's behind your opinion? What's behind your viewpoint? Gratitude. We are thankful when people share their opinions, right? We are thankful because that's not easy to do. It's easy just to sit there because we're afraid to voice an opinion because we can be attacked for it, right? So it's safer to just not talk. Well, sometimes it's only when I talk that I find out, well, I don't actually believe what I just said, right? Because sometimes you have to say it first and you go, I'm not sure I agree with myself. Uh, forgiveness, we forgive people because sometimes we're hurt when someone says something and, and we, they don't even know it, right? And there we are stewing in the car going home. So we want that to be the eighth commandment, which means we put the best construction on everything. And that is not practiced in our culture. And therefore, we know we're not good at this. We are not good at this. And therefore, we want to remind ourselves. Uh, so we uh, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, bless our conversation. Help us. Uh, to go deeper into your word, give us your Holy Spirit. Bless our fellowship. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask Caitlin to put up a couple pictures here, and I hope you can see those live streaming as well as here at home. Uh, because I went as a 16 year old boy, my grandmother, Swedish, uh, she took me to Sweden. She wanted to show me her home. She had not been back since she was 17, since so she had been immigrated to Ellis Island. I was her Schwenska Poik. I have the Swedish face. I'm uh, half German. I'm half German. Okay, so, but I'm half Swedish, you know, and so no one else in our family looks Swedish outside from me. So she took me as her Schwenska Poik. And, and uh, I saw some of these churches, um, and I had no idea. Uh, what they meant, I just knew, I thought they were beautiful, and they were eight-sided churches. So we're just going to go through a few of these, because they might remind you of churches back in a rural environment, or maybe where you travel. They're all over the world, these churches, all over the world. Like this one, I just love this in Norway in particular, has uh, the Scandinavian architects love this design. I believe we even have one here in Naples. I think St. Agnes is built with eight sides. I've not seen that personally, but St. Anne's. St. Anne's. Eight side. Where is that? Third. 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 Okay. It, it's a classic design. And when I saw these as a, 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 as a young man, but also later <coughs> on in life, um, I just thought they were beautiful. I never asked why would an architect build a church with eight sides? Never crossed my mind. Interestingly, the baptismal font uh, at our church in rural Maryland was also eight sided. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. any of you remember growing up in churches with those old baptismal yeah. fonts yeah. of eight sides? Yeah. No one ever explained though to yeah. me why they were eight sides. Where did all this come from? Now you notice some of them will have eight sides and then they'll build something mm -hmm. like an entrance or a sacristy or but the major design, especially in some of the cathedrals, uh, you can see this basic eight side with an entrance here. Uh, it's just a, it's just a classic design. Thanks. But again, I didn't know why. So I'm on a trip to uh, Turkey and Greece. And there we're looking at the first church in Europe, which is the Church of Philippi. 
and the, the um, you know, the ruins are there, but they're well preserved ruins. So you can see again, this eight sided church, by the way, they had two, the church in Philippi grew dramatically um, after Paul did his initial missionary work. And when Constantine became emperor, uh, the, the, the church just exploded. So they had two cathedrals, eight sided, both of them in Philippi. And it was the first time when I said, you know, I know that numbers mean a lot in the church, right? I, if it had been 10-sided, I would have thought, oh, okay, commandments, right? If it had been 12-sided, which makes no sense, I would have thought, oh, the New Jerusalem, right? The, new, the, the 12 apostles, right? That would have made sense to me. Uh, what are some of the other holy numbers? Seven. 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 We and, have seven, seven, seven. Which is the perfection of, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Seven is the days of creation. Mm -hmm. So perfection, mm -hmm. God rests. The number three mm -hmm. is holy. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of holy perfection, so to speak. Matt, that's what was behind calling you, you know, yeah. seven, seven, seven. Uh, what, what other numbers? Six, six, six. That's the perfection of, six, of evil, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, six is imperfection. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what other numbers do we have any other 40 40 three you know right three 40 of course uh, uh, this time in the wilderness often represents uh so but eight didn't strike me as a number i knew that had uh meaning and that's why then this uh guide and i'll turn you to the um Introduction, and especially those who are following uh, online. I'm going with this guide. It's on page two, about two paragraphs or three paragraphs down. It says, Early Christians, our God explains. So I was asking, and I was, uh, what struck me, and I'm going to ask you this in a second, uh, how important architecture is, but this Winston Churchill quote I love oh, yeah. We shape buildings. Thereafter, they shape us. I think that's really true. And anybody who's lived in a house you've either liked or not liked, I think can attest to that. There comes a time when you want the architecture, the flow of the house to serve you, right? And the way we build houses today are not how we built them 40, 50 years ago, right? Uh, the way we build churches today is not how we built them 40, 50 years ago. Very, very different. And so I think I was interested, uh, I knew this quote, why did they build an eight-sided church? What were they trying to say? I had no idea, so I asked our guide, and the guide was well informed. Uh, not a Christian, by the way, not a Christian, he was a Muslim. He said, early Christians were focused on God's new creation, begun in Jesus, who rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. Sometimes we forget about that unless you look at your calendar. Mm -hmm. Sunday is the first day of the week. It's not the seventh day. It's not the Jewish Sabbath, right? It's a work day in the old calendar. Mm -hmm. Instead of calling it the first day of the week, for example, however, these Christians understood resurrection as the continuation of God's creative activity. That blew my mind. So the first day of the week became the eighth day of creation. Now, does that make sense? God rests. God creates in six days. God rests. And then God starts, starts creating again. And it's a, an amazing tradition to say it's now all starting again, but now based on the resurrection. On Jesus actually being the first fruit of the eighth day of creation. The, the, we hear from the uh, on Sunday of uh, the Easter season what what uh, you and Pastor Steve are uh, preaching about is resurrection people, and I think that the resurrection people is that the eighth day. Uh, the, that that that's what's going on. New life. So, yes, but I didn't always get that growing up. I'll be honest with you. For me, it was about Sunday was a day of rest, mm -hmm. not of work. We're going to get into that. It was a day of not working, of just going and singing praise. So if you're in the choir, I guess you're working, right? You know, if you're a pastor, you sweat. Uh, there, there are things going on there. Um, 
but often even salvation took on that characteristic of RIP, rest in peace. It wasn't about new creation, God created new creation. It was rather, I'm going to die and I'm going to check in to this retirement mansion, right, <laughs> with streets of gold and Bach on the organ. And, and yes, I'm going to sing forever and ever. That's it. We're just going to be praising, which is not always a compelling image for many people. And here, the eighth day, you know, there are choir people who, who, who might enjoy that image of singing for the rest of, of eternity. Uh, but to say there's going to be work to do, and we'll talk more about this in other chapters. I'm going to ask, not today, um, do you envision us doing work in heaven? This tradition is very clear. We've entered a season of work, a resurrection of work, of creating a new heaven for a new earth. And that's not how I was, I think, uh, catechized to begin with. Robert? Why is work, uh, why is creation considered work? Why is it a problem? Because work for me. What's that? When I'm creating or co creating with other people, I'm experiencing the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I don't feel that's work. Well, I, I think both of those go together. I know a lot of people who will get caught up in an activity. It could be a puzzle, it could be knitting, it could be uh, painting, it could be uh, cooking. Uh, although you got to be careful there because you got your work around fire. Uh, mm -hmm. But they get caught up, which is a beautiful thing is that when you're so caught up in your work, you don't even notice what you're doing. It's just that, that beautiful, you're just completely focused in on what you're gardening. There's just times when you go, I'm locked in. Mm -hmm. So you can be pretty excited, pretty locked in. The Holy Spirit is, but it's work. I mean, that's what the Bible defines. Six days and we worked, seventh day, or even God worked, seventh day rest. So that's sort of the biblical vocabulary um, that we're using here. I, there's a line in here that I can't quote, but it's something like work, work is when something happens. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that's the definition of work here is causing something to happen. Uh, we're going to define that here in a second um, because we're going to use these three words of faith, work, and economics. We want to define them right off the bat so we know what we're talking about. Um, but that's part of this language of architecture. Before we define architecture, which would be faith or economics, we'll define them. I want you to think about the house you grew up in mm -hmm. versus now the architecture of where you live now. Can you describe the difference? I grew up in a little parsonage, you know, in rural Maryland, you know, on the corner of, of, of uh, uh, a cow field. Uh, so, you know, the farmer just gave a corner of his lot, right, to the church and there. The parsonage, and they were all small homes, but with five bedrooms. Why would you want five bedrooms for your pastor? Good case. Good. 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 I've never had five beds. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually three, and they were little. <laughs> so we grew anyway. up in Catholic Maryland. I think they expected yeah. the clergy to uh, populate the Sunday school. <laughs> I, no, that's they just did. Uh, uh, they expected large, you know. Uh, uh, well, you, yeah, you, you, you have a larger home and you have the Sunday school and that was sort of expected, but all very small rooms because heating at that time was still less than efficient, let's put it that way, right? And as, as heating and air conditioning systems got more sophisticated, you could do different things. But the kitchen was its own room. Mm -hmm. And then you bring the food out to... Um, a dining room, sometimes that was a formal dining room, sometimes your formal dining room was a whole other room. We had a living room that no one ever touched. <laughs> no one ever went in. You weren't even allowed to look into the living room. Did you have plastic <laughs> on the Black, I mean, uh, <laughs> because that was for guests. So when was a guest not, would come to the home. Was it not called a but now when you think about even just the kitchen and the dining room setup, how many have like a wide open That's space right. between yeah. the kitchen? I think at one time the thinking was, okay, I could mess, I could 
I could mess up the kitchen and close the door and right. still have Hopefully people coming in. Now they see their mess. <laughs> now your mess, it's a more transparent uh, operation, right? Uh, what other major changes? Because we're talking about architecture, which is the way we want to live, right? The reason architecture designing houses differently, because they know our expectations of family life. Um, where do we put the TV? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the wall. We, we, we don't, but yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah. we had a TV room when I grew up. Yeah. There was one room, it was the, the TV room. And now that wouldn't work. I, I mean, if the family would all watch one show is, is incomprehensible. <laughs> One um, bathroom. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> One bathroom for all the kids, right? <laughs> and we shared that uh, my mom and dad did not have a master bedroom. We did later on, but not that first. Uh, first so, One TV. What's that? One TV. We yeah, weighed about a thousand pounds. So you think about right. homes, but now move to the architecture of, let's say, a restaurant. When you pull up to a restaurant and think of various restaurants, what does the architecture tell you about what you can expect from the experience? Think of your favorite restaurant, but think of your favorite restaurants. Various this is my favorite, but I think that what it's switching to now is like an industrial look where they have the higher ceilings. I think they're attracting a younger, it tells me they're attracting a younger crowd. And the noise level is unbelievable oh, high. I know. <laughs> so you can't talk to anybody. <laughs> they want it noisy yeah. because they want you to yeah. eat and get out. Oh. Yeah. See, I, I, I mean, they don't want you to sit and there. linger and talk. They want you to eat and leave. Yeah. So, right, it's, it's, it's conscious. Mm -hmm. It also gives that sense of, oh, everybody's here. Mm -hmm. It's packed. There's energy in the room. It creates energy. But it doesn't create a, a comfortable conversation. conversation mm -hmm. environment. Right. Right. What, what else do you think about? Uh, and again, if you've got um, comments on live stream, just put up your hand and, and Caitlin will uh, will bring you into the discussion. Go ahead, Caitlin. Well, I was just, are you still on the restaurant? I'm thing? still on the restaurant. Because okay. I'm thinking like Lake Park Diner, which is outside, it's casual, you yeah. come, it's like a kind of, it could be like a little party, you know, with whoever you're with. Or you can go, let's say, to Seasons 52 and you walk in and there's fire. If you go to the bar area, it's real lively, but you can be over to another area. It's a little darker, um, a little more restful. Um, so it just depends where you go. So it's not just about what food I want to eat necessarily. It's okay, what kind of atmosphere, atmosphere. do I yeah. want to enjoy this evening uh, at, at, the, at the restaurant, right? Any other examples? Pat? Right in front of Lake Park Restaurant is a territory. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the two completely different, <laughs> different, you know, the lake, there's right. Lake Park, and right in front of it, there's the DQ, and you can get food at both of them, and mm -hmm. think of the, the differences, you know, the cultural differences between mm -hmm. that and that. And it's like, think of how many architectural changes uh, McDonald's has gone through mm -hmm. since uh, mm -hmm. we used to go up and get burgers outside, you know, snowing, I just thought it was snowing. Yeah, and, and because they're trying to say something about right what what environment around fast food versus some of these other experiences. Okay, now let's go to churches. What do you notice about the architecture of churches, and what difference that what are because churches are trying to say something about themselves, about their mission, about their purpose, the way they are designed. Well, I noticed like Jehovah Witness churches don't usually have windows for some reason. You notice that? I don't know if it's construction cost or or what it is. And then some of them are large and some are all different shapes and sizes. And, you know, like little Baptist church all seem to have the same symmetry and Catholic churches are a little more elaborate. Now, this is not the reason for Jehovah's Witnesses, but more and more churches don't have windows because of technology. So what they want to do is to control the technology inside the space and you can do that better without windows. Mm -hmm. Or if you have windows, they'll have shades that come down in front of them. It's because they want, they don't want light 
content to creep in like and ruin the sharpness <laughs> yeah. of your video yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, projection. Wow. Right. I think the church oh, is today a yeah. less traditional looking. Um, with the big steeples and the fancy things, I think it's a bit more modern looking. Um, I'm even watching that temple be, um, not, the, not the temple itself, but the temple so long, but the cultural center, you know, uh, with the uh, different kind of windows, the block windows, and the men's sunlight, it's, it's different and modern, modern. A lot of churches are getting rid of pews and putting chairs so they can be multi-tasking mm -hmm. and um, and really it's pretty expensive to have a sanctuary that's used for Sundays so they also use it for basketball courts and you know so there's an economic argument there yeah, right. that can we have a space uh sort of like a, a football stadium would yeah. be analogous right can we have a football stadium that's Built on significant tax dollars, just sitting there, mm -hmm. only used for ten games, you know, mm -hmm. a year, right? Mm -hmm. So when people build them, they they say just now, like churches, can can we use that space more creatively during the week, right? It's an economic argument. And my home church, it's now defunct, and it's a uh, furniture warehouse. Mm -hmm. They did take out the stained glass windows, sold them to another church, mm -hmm. but that's a uh, a very small one. It wasn't one that you know, wasn't like Vanderbilt Presbyterian. <laughs> so one of the questions in the old style was, what is our witness, right? Let's tie the cross. Yeah. We want the cross lifted up in the neighborhood to say something about the mission of that church. Steeples are still around. Mm -hmm. Now, does Vanderbilt have crosses on the top of their steeples? Uh, yes, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's that idea of when you're driving down what Immokalee, you see that. I mean, it, it's, yes. and, and it's meant to be seen that this is a place where Christ is proclaimed. Robert, the idea of a church, when you see a church, it's a symbol, and the churches, for example, that you showed in Norway and Sweden are symbolic of something, but normally that symb symbolism is supposed to rise people up, to be inspiring, filled with spirit. Many churches today are losing that inspiration. And as he said, you know, look more like auditoriums or factory buildings. And I just might make one comment. I brought a number of people to this church, and most people who came up the, uh, through the, uh, from Creighton over here, this coming up this mm -hmm. way, didn't realize that this is a church. They yeah, said, oh, yeah. we thought that was an office building. <laughs> and I'll tell you exactly why. Because if you look at the foyers out here, right. the cloisters, they look like the factory. They are not inspiring. <laughs> it's an anomaly for some people. So that uh, um, we can take a look at our architecture here. And because we can do that with any church. Because each church, the architecture is trying to reflect a certain mission, a certain purpose about the church. What does the architecture of this uh, uh, church reflect? Then we're going to use that for our own life. How do we build our own architecture as far as a, a life of discipleship? So we're trying to use these to make some analogies. If you walk up, first of all, you're not quite sure. Now, there is a steeple. Mm -hmm. So if you see that, that there, there's a marker. I right? see, though, coming up this other way. I would say the Covenant Church has a, you know, uh, other than the cross on the side, you wouldn't know immediately that was a church. That could be another large facility, which is meant that way. That's part of a, a, a certain tradition that says we're against religious art. Right? That's the iconoclastic. Art was not good. Stained glass windows, not good. Uh, uh, statues, not good. Right? It's like a, the Methodist tradition, Jehovah's Witness. It's, it's just the word of God. So you'll go in there and there's nothing in the sanctuary other than the pulpit. And that's meant to focus on the word. And, and it was kind of a, sort of anti-Catholic at the time, right? Anti-icons. Uh, uh, These are idols that are being worshipped. You know, they're praying to, to Mary and Joseph. And, oh, and so we, we're going to eliminate all that to make it simple. Only focus on um, the pulpit. So, that, again, 
the architects know the community and design it around that purpose. What is our purpose? I think of our church as having a very beautiful sanctuary and a lot of stuff were tacked on later. A lot of things, you know, hallways and classrooms and family life center. It, it, it's not a real cohesive looking building as a whole. Mm -hmm. A little bit like a cloister, a little bit, you know, because when you walk in the middle here, you're, yeah. you're kind of surrounded. The church itself is very cohesive. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, yes. With, you know, the, just that beautiful altar, the coral. Yeah, the and then the, um, yeah, the stained glass windows, similar stained glass windows are all in that, the kneelers, the, the mm -hmm. cushions you have there. Um, so I think the church itself is I very too. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I, I could see how this one has. It wasn't built for technology. No, we've had to adapt technology. I think there's more of a sense of mystery, right? Because you're around the, the altar is spectacular. Right. Yeah. And so you can, when you walk in, it just sort of drives your eye to it. I think the next is, of course, the, the light coming through the windows mm -hmm. and the story being told of redemption mm -hmm. of, of all the windows that are surrounding. So you know it's a liturgical church when you walk in, mm -hmm. right? Because you can see a large altar that size. You wouldn't have that in a non liturgical church. They wouldn't use the space. They'd, you know, they'd have the band up there or they'd have the choir in the back. <laughs> Fire in the back here is not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Fire lot is. But you sound great. <laughs> That's good. Exactly. We don't want you to look at the camera. We don't want you to feel too comfortable. Oh, that's true. But the yeah. color loss, you know, that, that, that's always a controversy, the controversy, you know, because we had a, a pipe organ and we didn't have no, a pipe organ. Yeah. But you notice it was designed. With the choir in mind, because you yeah. guys get a special entrance into the church yeah. that no one else like has. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They, they get to go right from the practice area, right into the right, the, right to that area, and uh, no one else gets that special treatment. Uh, one other thing there is the, the pulpit. Your eye, <clears throat> when you walk into the church, your eye is immediately drawn to the pulpit, which to me says preaching is important here. Yeah. And I'm a little bit uncomfortable with a little, little bitty lecture in the kit. Yeah. But even worse than that, my church back in Indiana just has a music stand up there. <laughs> so we've done away with, with anything that says preaching is important. By the way, uh, um, if the Gulf of Mexico uh, overtakes us here, if we get a surge and everything is destroyed here, there will be two pieces that will not be moved. Do you know what those two yes. pieces are? The old one, the altar. The baptismal font oh, yeah. and the altar, right? And that is meant to say something about gravitas, right? There's certain things that, now the pulpit probably would go, uh, depending on the surge, how high the surge would, would mm -hmm. Oh, what I was gonna say is like, when you look at the architecture of the church, it's like driving around Naples and you look at a home that's been renovated. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, that doesn't make sense. Did they, they added that, they added that, yeah. they added that. Mm -hmm. So when the sanctuary was built, it's nothing else no. looked like that. Right. And then they had a school. So then they had to build stuff to have a Christian school here. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you kind of have to look into the, the history of that. And like they would just like a house that, oh, this is a, an original house from the 70s. And here's a brand new one right beside it. And what's the difference? And what are you doing to the inside to make it more like a modern house? And, okay, uh, so with, with this metaphor in mind of architecture, mm -hmm. How have you built your life of discipleship? What's the architecture that you use when you try to build your own life of following Jesus? Because as we move from our houses, to restaurants, to churches, <clears throat> the architecture makes a difference of what you can do and you cannot do. And I think you're right. Often we build it for one purpose and then we, we scramble, right? To, to, to change things around. And what I mean by this, and here's my fear, is that in many of our traditions, Sunday, what we do on Sunday, has almost no relationship to Monday. And we did, we'll talk about this in later chapters, um, but we did 100 visits here to people in their place of work. And we found out, could they connect Sunday and Monday? Could they connect their work lives with what we do? on Sunday. And the answer was many of them did, but they didn't learn it at a church. 
They didn't learn mm -hmm. it at all in church. They didn't learn Bible texts or catechism. Or, uh, in fact, one person said, if I wanted to know how to live a Christian life at work, I wouldn't ask the pastor. He apologized. He said, yeah, yeah. I just don't think you would know about or care about what I do on Mondays. And so that's where we're going. But now, I can remember going uh, and see if you were trained the same way I was. I was in a good church. But church, its relationship to Monday was it was to be a gas station. I can still remember us talking about the gas station, right? And that I'm to get filled up with gas on Sunday, right? It was to give me energy. It wasn't to help me relate to what I did. It didn't teach me about how to be a Christian on Monday. It was just about energy, motivation. It was like a cheerleader. Come on, Rick, you can do it. You know, we don't know how you're going to live your life on Monday. We really don't care, but we're going to give you the energy to make it. Being a little, uh, being a little sarcastic now, but only a little, only a little, yeah. right? That was the image I was told. Church was to sort of motivate. That was it. So cheerleader. It was gas in your gas tank, but it didn't inform the architecture of how I was to live on Monday. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting coming from similar backgrounds. So ours at, at my house, it was like, well, you didn't live up to all the expectations during the week, so you needed Sunday to kind of regroup and you know cleanse yourself so for all the bad things that happened during the week. So you kind of fell short, just like Martin Luther talked about. Yeah, you can't quite hit the mm -hmm. mark, <laughs> so you have to go to church. Just to, I guess it's like being energized, but just mm -hmm. to, but clean up. You're adding. Yeah. It, it's not just the gas station, but it is if you would add the uh, you take out the water and clean out the windshields and yeah. you clean out the you're stabilizer you're or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think. You know, I that? think it's like we didn't learn how uh, to apply what you learned in church to be. Because we all do something different and we look at some professions as more important or more holy than others. So we figure the pastor, he doesn't have to, you know, he has a great environment to practice his faith. But if you work for a high polluted financial firm, it becomes a little more difficult in our mind. And and that's the hard part to bridge. I mean, intellectually I understand it, but to really see Christ every day in the office can be challenging. Uh, particularly when you deal with clients, <laughs> you know, with other people of different backgrounds. So it's, you know it, but it's hard to practice. So here's what struck me, uh, and sort of what's behind the book. Church then became where I'm trying to convince you to do church work during the week. So I want you to come to church and be on a board. I want you to come to church and be on the evangelism committee. I want you to come to church and be an usher, right? These are all good things, by the way. But I never thought, oh, I'm supposed to train you on how to be a Christian Monday through Saturday, that that's one of our major, because you're going to spend how much time out in the world, I'll use this term, being a missionary, being a Christian, or in the biblical language of being a priest. That was what we're trying to prepare you for. And what was happening is we were saying, well, that, for some reason, that's not our job, or we just want to make sure the church is paying its bills, it's doing its mission as a gathered community, not realizing that most of the Christian activities happen when we're scattered, that God is actually loving the world through your work. That's how God is actually loving the world through your family ties, through your work life, through your mm -hmm. civic activity, mm -hmm. and through your church, through the gathered community as well. But you know, we almost learned not to, we almost learned that God didn't love the others. You know, it's like them, those people over there, or if they're not Christian, or if they're not this, or if they're not that. You learn to keep your distance growing up. I mean, I grew up in a, we were Catholic, we were Lutheran, and never the two shall meet. <laughs> I mean, we did not even go on each other's playground. That's so true. we grow up that way, mm -hmm. and it, everybody else is distant. 
it was so bad in our little town uh, <laughs> that we had a white line down the middle of the playground at the elementary Oh, and no, no, the Protestants played on one side, the Catholics played on the other side. Oh, my. And, and there was always, you know, that one Protestant boy who did. <laughs> I'm going to uh, <laughs> But you, 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 knew, you knew who the Catholic butcher was, and you knew who the Protestant butcher was. Right? And, and there were certain stores, and it was a whole lot, and everybody liked that because you knew your place. That's right. almost like. Okay. Like chapter one in tribalism. <laughs> no, they yeah, don't yeah. like you because if you're not fighting somebody else, you're fighting amongst each other. And it's comforting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not <laughs> Christian. <laughs> now, just be clear. It's not, but to find your tribe, where, and I was raised, you know, you didn't like Catholics. Oh, and there's those Presbyterians too. They don't understand communion. But, you know, everybody, <laughs> it was a tribalism, and that's how we built loyalty to Jesus, which of course is just, you think it's awful. I was raised on the east in Jersey, and we never had anybody like that. Um, my my city, Jersey City, basically was Catholic, Italian, and Irish. You know, and my very first girlfriend, she was Catholic, and she told me, knowing that I was Protestant, well, we're not going to go to heaven because we're Protestant. Oh, and I said, no, I'm going to go to heaven. I go to Bible school. <laughs> I go to <laughs> Why we go to Bible school? That's it. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, um, what I'm going to ask you to do, we're going to go over the definitions now of faith, work, and economics. If you look at the introduction, we're going to have to go through this. If you would like, you can stand up, stretch your legs, get a mimosa, uh, get some more, get to eat. Um, and again, the, those who are live streaming, if you want to raise your hand, just do so, and Caitlin will acknowledge you. Uh, uh, they're going to deliver the mimosa. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <get your> own. <laughs> so on, on page, this is the architecture of discipleship. That's why we use this uh, because in ancient cathedrals, if you've been like, how many of you have been to Notre Dame before? Or, it's telling a story. You were entering into a whole worldview of the gospel story. It wasn't just a place for worship, right? Uh, it's pretty remarkable. So. Here's the architecture. Faith, we're going to define here, is understood as our response to a promise by God. Uh, faith is always tied to a promise. And we are going to define this with Luther's small catechism. If you have that on your phone, that's good. If you don't, we have some copies here. Um, Luther's small catechism is how we will define evangelical faith, which means faith which is gospel-centered. Now, I have to distinguish this from American evangelicalism. That's different, right? In fact, some American evangelicals are even giving up the title of evangelical because they're saying that it's been too tied with politics and they want to go back to a biblical faith. Well, we uh, uh, as Lutherans, we're the evangelical Lutheran church, of, we're evangelical, right? We're, uh, we're the original evangelical, so to speak. And, but we define that with our catechism. And this is important for this uh, book, that we go back, especially as adults, and review the basics. Because many of us learned the catechism when we were kids. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't interested in work and economics when I was 13. Mm -hmm. I was interested in girls and sports. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the catechism does speak to those issues a little bit, especially the girls, uh, but just a little bit. And so I lost, I think, because I learned catechism at 13, you lose the context in which Luther was writing this, which was for adults. This is for our discipleship. It makes more sense, let's put it. Catechism makes more sense for an adult than it does a child. It just does. So that's how we want to define the faith, not in some abstraction. It's gospel-centered, and Luther will teach us how to keep the gospel centered. That's the first. Second, work. Work is the part of the created order. It describes how we care for, preserve, and sustain our lives and the lives of our various communities. In addition, and I get this from a speaker we've had here, Wayne Miller, work transforms this into that. I love that. That's the yeah. point of that. Yeah. That, that. That's Wayne Miller, and I just, I, uh, I've always leaned a lot from him. I just think he's just really smart. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to use work here, although Lutherans prefer the term vocation. 
We're going to lean that way. I just don't want to start talking about vocation because th that demands more thought, demands more theological explanation, right? But this, so the, the idea of vocation so overtook the Protestants in Europe that the whole educational system in Germany, for example, but others who, who reflected it, all, all based on vocation. You ask about some, a, a child's calling, and then you match the educational system with their calling. That might be to college, that might be to vocational school, mm -hmm. that might be at, in other areas. Um, we may be getting back to that United States more, right? One size does not fit all for education. Right. The first you ask the vocation question, where is, where is this child called? And then you match the education to that rather than to say it's sort of an industrial production and everybody has to have uh, the same thing. So work is important and we spend most of our days working. Six days, God works, seventh day, he rested. Right, so this, and we're not gonna talk about balance, but the relationship between work and rest is a big deal, even on the same day. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you rest every day? How do you work every day? What does that mean? So that will be a big um, deal. Economics is maybe the hardest term. Um, I was just in Wisconsin at the Current Family Foundation and they were starting to drop the term economics. They were starting to talk about flow uh, for the life of the world. How does the church work for the life of the world? And uh, they're the ones who converted me to economic land. So I, so I, sort of, I sort of pushed back and said, you've got to have economics. Because, for example, if you talk to a child about vocation and it doesn't have an economic component, that's just an abstraction. Right? Because every... You know, all parents go through this, right? Our child grows up and says, what do you want to do in college? Well, I want to be a literature major. I want to be a, an art major. Talking about my kids here. <laughs> okay, and then you take a deep breath. You go, okay, we want to support your passion. We want to support your passion. But, but how are you going to uh... earn a living? Because <laughs> yeah. you got to earn a living. Well, we hadn't thought about it. We're following our passion. Right. Okay. Well, that's our job as parents to to bring in right the economic question that you still have to sustain yourself. And and we've all probably had various conversations, not just with our kids, but with ourselves. Right? Are, are we on a sustainable path? Because sometimes we're doing things we love. Right. Other times we can retire because we've made enough at one stage in our life that we can now really volunteer and do things in another stage of our life, but we're allowed to do that because we've already basically built uh, uh, economic sustainability, right? So, And here, audio is gone. Hey, Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> You're the best. Oh, who's, who's talking? <laughs> It's Jim. Oh. <laughs> hey. Can anybody else hear Rick? I can't. Oh, I, can't. I can't either. Eric and Gail can't either. Okay. Can you hear us now? Can you hear now? Yes. Yeah, there's an echo, though. Okay. So. Okay, so. Te 
technology is wonderful. Sometimes. Is it still echoing? Is it? Um, Pat, is it still echoing? Can you hear us now, Pat? Yes. Yes, I'm good. And, and there's no well, I'm continue, I'm going to continue here uh, um, as we try to figure this out. In in the Wall Street Journal, when they show you the graphs and the num it's to tell the story. What's the good life? And uh, uh, does do the graphs support that or not? Are are we achieving uh, sustainability or not? Are we growing or not? Uh, there are moral questions behind every economist graphs. They try to hide sometimes behind neutral numbers, but really they're trying to say, is the business working? Is the business successful? Are we achieving our purpose? All these things are behind the graphs and the numbers. And we all do that around our kitchen tables, right? Is the family functioning, right? Can we pay our bills? Can we pay off college? Can we do the things that we want? Can we pay our medical bills, right? That's the economics. First of all, that tells a big story. The Bible uses the term economics to talk about God's big plan of salvation. The Bible uses the term God's economy. And in formal theological language, that's called the economic trinity. I learned that in school, but I didn't use it a lot. I don't think I've ever said it in a sermon because I didn't think it mattered. I, you know, I didn't know how to use those terms. But that is the Bible's notion that in Christ, God has instituted a new economy. You know how we talk about Trump's economy or we talk about Biden's economy. Anytime a president comes in, right, we describe their economy. Well, now God has said, in Christ, I've established a new economy, a new dispensation, so to speak. And then the question is, well, then how does God manage the world? So the idea of the economy is God in Christ is managing the world. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father governing the world. He's the president, so to speak. Although in the Bible, that we call him the king. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord of all. Well, how does the Lord manage the world? Through you. Mm -hmm. Through the Holy Spirit in you. So how is God loving my wife? Through me. How is God loving your children? Through you. How is God loving people who want a new coat of paint on their house? Matt. <laughs> and you know how that is that when you, because we all know when we've had good experiences from painters or bad experiences, you know, it can, it can be like the kingdom of God when you have a good experience. It can be like hell if, if you have a bad experience, right? How people serve you. God is then functioning in the world, building this new heaven and earth through you and your work. The uh, faith, work, and economics, as, as I was reading this, I noticed that his faith is understood as our response, and I under, underline that, to a promise by God, and then work, is that work is a response to God's various calls in our lives. And the, uh, the word response just leaped out at me, and our part in that is to, to do something. Uh, how do we respond to what God is putting out there? I would say, uh, now push back if you disagree, I would say most workers aren't happy in their work. And if you said, is God loving the world through your work? They would say, I've never even thought about it. That just n never even dawned on me. Now, some professions, like teachers, will sometimes respond very positive because they can see they're helping children right um but then you've got like our kindergarten teachers here uh you know they all they all had to quit in january because the economics wasn't working or the covid came in right it, which just destroyed everything so first of all we say economics is about the big picture of what god's doing in the world secondly it's about god's management how does God manage and how does God use us in that management of the world? And thirdly, then it's about the uh, dollars and cents, because often that's how you know if the thing's working or not. Right. If, 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 if the dollars aren't coming out right, then something's something's off. Maybe it's injustice. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it was poor design. Uh, it raises all those questions that we're used to asking 
when things aren't working right. So we want to say God is in the numbers, but now how is God in the numbers? How do we interpret of economics in a theological way. I think the first thing you said though was most people are not happy in the work, mm -hmm. so they don't see God in it. Well, that's because they might not be doing the work God intended them to do. Mm -hmm. So if you find someone that's happy in their work, a lot of times it's because they're using the gift that God gave them. And so it's almost like, yeah, they're not happy and that could be why. We'll talk about that in the chapter on, on faith and work. Uh, it, it's complex, but often, uh, I think now, just in this chapter, I want to say people aren't happy. I, I mean, the, the, the statistics on this with HR experts is no, no, quite, no, quite hot. Really and then we have to press now, why is it that so many people are not happy at their work? Is it, uh, and, and then you've just started to try to answer that. I, I sort of want to respond to both those comments. The other option is that maybe they're not bringing God to their work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or maybe the work is wrong. And then the other part about faith is understood as our response to a promise by God. I think of our faith as being our belief in God, and that belief would engender a response. Mm -hmm. See, I'm just saying that the faith is the response. That seems a little off to me. Faith is response? Yeah, you have faith is understood as our response to a promise by God. Right. Now, to me, I can have faith in something, and because of my faith, I will do stuff or respond in a certain yeah. way. I don't think of faith as being the response. Yeah, I, I, I'd say like for the discussion now, I'd say it's both. Okay. Uh, it's like um, my wife looks deeply in my eyes and says, I love you. Uh, well, that elicits a response. Uh, was the love already there and now I'm just, you know, tingly more or is that eliciting love? I think it's both uh, depending on on how I'm feeling that day, uh, right? So when God speaks a word of love to us, it creates faith. And at the same time, when God speaks a word of promise, our faith grabs onto that and does, you know, responds to it. So there's I think there's multi dimensions. I don't want to to say it's one or the other because I think it's a, it's like love. It's a pretty complex um, reality that functions in various ways. Edie and Robert. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in the Evangelical United Brethren Church, which is now Methodist, but like we had our own thing. And when you first started this, this just kind of blew my mind because from the time we started Sunday school. We would have little skits on how to be a Christian lawyer, mm -hmm. how to be a Christian baker, how, you know. And this was just all part of our growing up. You did take God to your um, workplace, and you were the only sermon that some people heard. Mm -hmm. So if you acted just miserably, that's the sermon they got for that day. You know? <laughs> and but other people didn't have this in their growing up. No, I think that was uh, probably very beneficial uh, mm -hmm. uh, the way you were raised. The, the, I remember, do uh, you remember Deidre? It was in Howard's office there for a while. Yeah. Uh, she answered, she was one of the, first, the only ones who learned that connection at church. Mm -hmm. because she went to a church with a, with a pastor who really emphasized these things right from the beginning. So for her, it was astounding that people didn't make these connections because she all always had them. Caitlin, do you have somebody? Uh, yeah, Don wants to speak, but Don, you have to unmute your mic. Maybe he had something to say. He's still working on the. Yeah, Don, it should be on the bottom left corner of your screen. There he is. All right, Dr. Yay. Oh, wait, no. Do you have to unmute the bottom of your screen? Well, we'll get reverb. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, well, that's something we're going to, Don, we apologize again. We finally got the unmute, and we can't, for some reason, speak, Don, since. Well, can you hear me? Uh, we've lost the, we've lost the, um. Pat, can you speak? Can somebody else try to see if it's just one computer? 
Don, I could hear you. No, nope, we've ben. lost uh, we've lost the sound here. From and we got the red light going. And we got the red light going. Rick. All, all, you, know, you feel like you're in the hospital. <laughs> I can hear you now. Okay, I just. Pastor, <laughs> so many things in economics, and the way I've worked through this for myself is to separate into three simple categories adversarial economics, transactional economics, and collaborative economics. <laughs> adversarial economics is what you're seeing with Putin in Ukraine, where he goes in bombs the whole place and then steals the grain, for example. That's uh, robber baron capitalism. And there's Mansky capitalism and economics, which is very transactional. I'll do a deal. You know, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you uh, three spoons for that glass of that bottle of water. Then there's collaborative economics, which is much more spiritual and it's God's economics, where we're all working together to create values. And I think what you're really implying here is that we're we're focusing on the collaborative economics of how do we work together to create more value, to create a one plus one equals three. So if you if you talk, Robert, about the economic vision of the Bible, that Jesus is Lord, sitting at the right hand of the Father, uh, managing the world. And then you say, oh, and how is, how is Jesus managing the world? Well, one way is by using us. Mm -hmm. and that change, now my work becomes critically important and i ask all sorts of questions am i in the right spot is this where god wants me to serve the world in the management and then of course i'm going to be collaborative because we're all working under king jesus right to try to get also the dollars and cents to work because obviously sometimes that all comes together and other times the economics of any type of work we do uh reflects it's broken it's not working it's not working right so there must be something about our collaboration that we have to, maybe that's why we're collaborating is trying to fix some of those problems. Let's turn to page 17 and here's my concern. And I really feel that way being down here in Florida in that if you don't build your house the right way here and the storms come, good gracious. Um, you know, uh, how many took damage at Irma? Yeah, and a lot of people had well-built houses right and and uh i was just amazed at the power you know janet that one pot in the back that was well secured this massive thing and it was mm -hmm. the metal was ripped yeah. you know and, and you're going whoo yeah. you know and and the you know palm trees become you know like weapons yeah. um the coconuts can go flying and so um how do you build this is a biblical image, right, from the Sermon of the Mount. How do we, you know this text, um, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house, as we know, on the beach, right? <laughs> now, how as a church are we building our architecture to build on rock and not on sand, to put it, in, to use this text? And let me just say, I, I, I feel guilty here. Um, one hour on Sunday isn't gonna do it. Cause that's the way we built the architecture of many of our churches. If we can just get people to come for an hour on Sunday, that's sufficient. In fact, we're actually happy about that. You know, if they'll come and tithe, you know, that's a, that's a good day. <laughs> and then the, the problem is though, we all go home and we're watching cable TV, we're reading newspapers, we're talking to friends and there's catechesis going on the whole time. So uh, I, I like to say with my brother, because we would talk about these things, um, there was one cable guy he really liked uh, before he died. He listened to him while he worked four to five hours a day. Well, that was catechesis. And there's nothing I could say or preach in 20 minutes that could match someone else who's got four to five hours a day of, of my brother's attention. 
It's just that's the way it works, right? And so I believe there are these other catechisms that are out there that are so impactful that they are um, governing our lives and our thinking. And I'm, I'm saying all of us here, myself included, because I do that too. I listen to a lot of cable. I read a lot of journals and newspapers and you, know, you try to do it in a balanced way. You know, you, you're getting catechized, right? And, and, and I always want to say, well, what is the Christian viewpoint? Mm -hmm. And that's hard to figure out sometimes. So I feel at times that we're building an architecture, a house on the sand, and, and you can't do that in Naples. Naples, you, you can't afford that because you know the storms are going to start. When, when season? June, July? But you know August, September. Ugh, you know. So here are the four, and I'd like you to read those this week. Uh, the first is moralistic therapeutic deism. This is the one Robert loves to uh, argue with me about the most. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying because uh, Robert, I think it's fair to say you would see atheism as the largest threat uh, to to many of our people. Uh, I would say, along with atheism, it's deism, which is a watered down Christianity. It's that God is there. God wants you to be moral. If you're moral, God will take you to heaven. God's goal for you is just to be happy. That's not Christian teaching. We just have to say that over and over again that is not christian teaching <laughs> so it sounds religious especially because oh i'm not an atheist i believe in god mm -hmm. right and god wants me to be happy so I'm, I'm i'm going about my work i'm trying to be happy in my life well, where does god say that in the scripture like the goal for you is to be happy now there are some, God wants us to thrive, so that's that's good. But God's got bigger purposes in life, obviously. And so this can be destructive. And here's, you'll see the research here. It was a, a youth leader who found out that many, many young people felt this way about God. Mm -hmm. And where did they get it? Their parents. They learned it from their parents. Secondly, capitalism. I'm not trying to discuss capitalism versus socialism here. That's not my interest in economic theory. It's that capitalism or any economics theory can overflow its banks. And now, instead of teaching us how production works, how uh, earning potential and how to meet needs uh, in the community work, um, it now sets up morals. It tells us how the rest of our life should function. So all of a sudden now the market becomes how we decide on all sorts of moral issues aside from just economic issues, right? Thank you, sir. So that is a concern. And you even, you know, uh, well, so we'll talk about how economy has to stay in its lane because there are other lanes, or there are other influences that are out there. Uh, that are important as well. Economics has its place here. I'm talking about more than the narrow sense of economics, uh, um, but it's it, the moral worldview is is you know we we don't vote on morals. You know, sometimes you wish you could, but but uh, that's not the way Scripture lays out a moral vision that God gives us. Let's say with the commandments. Uh, I'd love to vote on the commandments, but that's just not <laughs> my role, right? And, and uh, third one is prosperity gospel. I have to say that I don't find this one to be as influential in Lutheran circles, but it's out there. Mm -hmm. And that is the transaction to use Robert's language between me and God. You know, if I do certain things, then God will bless me if I don't do certain things. And are there scriptures of, of, that reflect that in the Old Testament? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. So we often say sin does create a lot of confusion, a lot of destruction, and can cause also economic pain. We know that from our experiences, right? And, you know, uh, that's why we tell our kids, you know, stay on the straight and narrow because, well, boy, uh, if you don't, that could. However, we can't earn God's favor with good works. I mean, it's like at the heart of the Reformation, right? Uh, God's favor comes to us through Christ. 
And so it, it's not like I can earn God's favor by putting a big check in the offering plate or other acts of. If you're an insomniac, you really get a lot of the prosperity gospel about 1.30 in the morning. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. 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 Duly noted, 1.30 in the morning, uh, <laughs> cable TV. Oh. It, it's, it's widespread, it's, it's, uh, it's especially in certain Pentecostal circles, it's, but not just. I think there's just something about the human condition that oh, yeah. always wants to earn God's favor. And if someone tells me how I can do that, it goes back to the ancient pagan rites and rituals of sacrifice. You know, at, at, if, if I sacrifice... And serious, I will win God's favor. And then when's the sacrifice big enough? And finally, I sacrifice my firstborn son. Maybe that will show God how serious we are. And uh, and then maybe the rain still doesn't come. Now what do we say? So it, it puts us into an insecure relationship with God. And that's, of course, directly in opposition to what uh, Jesus is. Finally, tribalism. Um, this one is hard. I was just going to say, if you do it like that, doesn't that kind of put God to the test? I sacrificed my son and the rain didn't come and you get kind of perturbed, you know, because the crops won't grow. And I don't know. Uh, I just had a, a woman who's got a daughter, uh, a son here in the preschool. Her um, husband just left his church because God did not give him a job. He's been working at it, working at it, working at it. And no results, no results. He's he's depressed about his work. He's not, he's got all this passion. It's not being utilized. He's he is depressed about it. And so he left the church because that was the transaction he had made with God. I will do certain things. I will be faithful to you, and then you'll get me a job. And it didn't work. So now, okay, enough of that. So that's the problem with this transactional notion of prosperity gospel. The last is tribalism, and then we'll close. Uh, tribalism um, is important. I want to feel like I belong in my family. I want to feel like I belong in my community. I might want to belong to a political party and feel welcome there, or, or, to a club, uh, to the United States. These are all normal and healthy until they're not. <laughs> until we weaponize our tribalism and we paint white lines down our playgrounds and say the Protestants are on one side, Catholics. And by the way, both Protestant and Catholics love that because that was their identity. I'm not Catholic, I'm Lutheran, right? It, it affirmed both sides. In, in, you know, in Scotland, you know which scotch to drink based on whether you're Protestant or Catholic. It goes down to, in German villages, to the minutia. I went and prayed my first time in Germany. I prayed with my hands like this, and I was accused of being a Catholic, right? Because mm -hmm. Protestants prayed like this. Catholics prayed like this. Down to the minutia. So that is not healthy. So how do we form our identity? And, and Lutherans, we, we love this, right? I'm used to be I'm not Missouri Synod. I'm, you know, ALC or, you know. And so we built this tribalism. And each one had the truth. <laughs> so now how do we move beyond? We now know how destructive that is, like world wars, mm -hmm. right? Where Christian nation Republicans fought. And Democrats. Republicans and Democrats, right? Our country now is being destroyed by that. Mm -hmm. the so if my identity is more in, in my political tribe than into Jesus, then I can't be united with anybody because they're evil and I can define the evil. And we, you're exactly right. That's the tribalism that, that I, I believe certain uh, cable stations, certain groups, certain speakers, certain books are actually promoting. They want us divided up. It's good for the market. It's good for their sales. And as Christians now, how do we escape the, I'd say the tribalism is one of the biggest ones we're facing now. But I'd say the other ones. And so what we're building, if you build on sand, if we're only there for one hour on Sunday, it's going to be hard to beat tribalism. I just think it's just too strong a force. And again, that doesn't mean I can't belong to some tribes, but I can't idolize them. And so when Jesus says that we should love one another, if I can't do that because of my political party, 
then I've, now I'm in the idolatry realm. I can't love my neighbor as myself because politics is more important than the words of Jesus. I can't forgive them any longer, right? So I think we all know that's where we are. But all four of these, we want to test those this week, look at those, because uh, then next time we'll take a look at chapter one. We have to know the threats on why we're going back to this architecture of faith, work, and economics, and how that can help us as we go back to the catechism, get our footing again, right? Not be driven by tribalism, not be driven by deism, not be uh, driven by uh, um, uh, false uses of economic theories, or of, uh, which one did I miss? Um, one other one, uh, that we, have, we build on the rock. And that's what we're gonna try to do by talking about how does faith link up with work and economics. If we cannot make that connection between those three things of our lives, my theory is we're building on the sand. We're gonna be just blown away by, by our culture. Well, I don't know if we've got the uh, sound. Oh. Uh, that's the... We don't have the sound, but if Pat wanted to type, she, she can type. Oh. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll take a look at, um, I want you to go back at, and look at these four threats. It would be nice if you could say, are the, which ones do you feel most threatened by? Not the ones you think others are mostly threatened by, but what which do you find, well, like tribalism, as we were talking about, is, is a big one. And then we want to move into the catechesis. We want to look into the, the next chapter, which is on the relationship between faith and work. And if you're retired, we're not talking about work that, where you're paid. Work is what you spend most of your time doing every day, mm -hmm. right? We did have one comment, I think it's from Barbara. She says, I try to think of doing good for others before economics rules. If you don't have money, you give of yourself. And that's, as you say, part of the economic theory is Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, uh, governing the world through our work. So that fits in with this larger picture. Okay, God honey. is loving the neighbor through your work. Now, that might be feeding people out at the park. That might be spending time with your grandkids. That might be sharing uh, dinner with your mother every Sunday night. Uh, that might be volunteering um, downtown uh, for parades or for civic activities, right? These are all part of our callings on how God is governing the world. So then I have to ask myself, you know, am I responding to God's calling? right, as God calls me to all areas of these activities. It's not just the church, not just the church. Let's end with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, uh, uh, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for um, these conversations. We pray that your spirit would do its work now, that you would uh, inspire us and lead us and guide us so that we would indeed respond to, to your call and that you would create an architecture in our life that lead to true lives of disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.